with the, with the kids ministry uh, board and because it's, it's, it's easy to understand and work with and so thank you for working with us through our challenges here but ain't that something Michael and, uh, and Cheyenne they're a blessing to have um, okay just gonna kind of flow with things this morning how's that sound you know, Jesus loves us so much. He loves us so much. Um, Adrian, I just want to prophesy to you. You know, I've been really praying for you and Laura these last couple of weeks. And uh, you ended up texting me a couple of weekends ago. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've been praying for you guys, right? And so, I mean, it was just right on point. And, and, and I saw... You know, I just see you guys, because I know I know the layout of your home. I see you guys sitting in the living room that's by the kitchen in the chairs that you have there. And I see you guys just sitting in those chairs and just concerned about some things. You're talking and you're praying and, and, and you guys are concerned. You're, you're talking about breakthrough. You're talking about just some deliverance coming. You're, you're, you're talking about life blossoming. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that... You know, you guys are just talking about when is it going to end, you know? And um, and I saw that in the Spirit, and the Lord gave me a verse. Check this out. Man. You know, the Word of God is awesome, but then when He takes it and says, No, listen, I'm speaking to you with this. That's life. And then there's breakthrough. It's Isaiah 51. It's the one through four or something, I think. Listen to me, all who hope for deliverance. All who seek the Lord. Consider the rock from which you were cut. The quarry from which you were mined. Yes, think about Abraham, your ancestor, and Sarah, who gave birth to your nation. Abraham was only one man when I called him, but when I blessed him, he became a great nation. nation. And here's the real verse that I'm getting to here. The Lord will comfort Zion again and have pity on her ruins. Her desert will blossom like Eden. There's a blossoming coming. Her barren wilderness like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found there. Songs of thanksgiving will fill the air. Your desire for your home. To be filled with joy, gladness, thanksgiving, life, ministry. It's coming. It's in God's plans. Right? Don't lose sight of it. Don't lose hope of it. He's mindful of it. He's heard the things, the cries of your heart. He's seen the desires of your heart. They're coming. They're coming. Amen? Amen. And I want you guys to know that Whenever a word is released over someone, and if that resonates with you, you can grab a hold of that too. Okay? Yep. <clears throat> awesome. That's why I texted you last Saturday. I said, hey, you guys going to be in service. I got something for you, but I know how to hang on to something. I can hang on to it. You know? I can roll with the punches. We all have plans and, and life. I know you were watching, but I didn't want to do it that way, you know. I want to do it in person. Okay. So I've been looking forward to these next couple of weeks because they've been rolling around in my spirit, what I'm going to share these next couple of weeks. And... I've always kind of labeled these messages God and money. Because that's what it is. We're going to talk about God and money. But there's an adder to it this time. It's God and money, but we're going to talk about building an altar. You see, this is the third time that I've preached on money over a year. And... I don't touch it a lot because it's a tender subject to so many. I don't touch it a lot because this subject has been abused in the body of Christ. 
I don't touch it a lot because I put my trust in God to speak to you about obeying His word concerning money. Right? And I don't worry about whether we can pay the bills or not. I let God worry about that. But then the Lord began to convict me of the stance that I've taken over this past year. Over this past year, I've preached on money twice. September was the last time. And then January before that. And the Lord began to convict me because He reminded me of some things that He shared with Joya and I as we began to pray about the church and, and vision and Lord, what's it going to look like. And, and one of the things that the Lord spoke to us was Journey Church was going to be a very strong financial ministry. Well, I began to think about that, and the Lord said, in order for a ministry to be financially strong, its people has to be financially strong. I said, okay, Lord, that, okay, all right, yeah, one plus one equals two. That makes sense to me. And so then he, then he, then he questioned me, and this is where he began to convict me. If my people are supposed to be financially strong, so the church can be financially strong, and you only preach on money twice a year, right? Sometimes the Lord tells us things in questions, right? Yep. I said, okay, Lord, I see where you're going here. I see where you're going. And then he began to drop in revelation. Concerning finances, revelation concerning how we're to treat our finances and, and, and how we're to give. And these are things that I've known and things that Joy and I have been operating in for 20 years, but, but I've never really had him put scripture to it, if you will. Things that I've heard from other preachers and statements that I've heard and I've known that it was truth and we've operated in it, but... I've never really had a message, if you will. I've never really had a teaching, if you will, concerning the things that we've been operating in. And as he began to work these things out in me, I said, Lord, wow, well, we've been doing that. Because I could stand here today and say that we are not without want. Financially, I think I said that right. We don't want financially. Everything's on auto pay. I don't worry. We don't worry about nothing. There's nothing that we need. All our needs are met. And I hope you don't think I'm being prideful by standing up here saying this. I'm just declaring truth. Right? Like last week when I showed like King Nebuchadnezzar. Man, I'm majestic. I'm awesome. And God gave it all to me. That's, that, that was a good enough statement. It ended up in Bible from a pagan king. You know what I'm saying? Joy and I are without want. We're without need. If we want something, we can go out and get it. And it's not because I'm super smart or I'm really good at what I do. I, I barely graduated high school. God has blessed us. God has increased us. Let me tell you something. Money follows us. It does. I'm not going to mention any names just to protect people, but <clears throat> I'm going to say something some of you might have a hard time with, but it just I, I, I just have to share it. I was out of town um, on some meetings. For, for a, a big job that I'm quoting. I'm out of town with a couple of guys. And, and uh, one of them likes to stay at casinos when, when they're out of town. So he likes to, you know, do the casino thing a little bit. And so my boss called me and said, hey, I'm going to find a hotel near the casino. You know, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. I said, no, I'm good. So I, don't, I have, I've never gambled, you know. It's, I have no desire to. I'm not going to. You know, pull out 10 grand and go sit at the craps table. And, you know, I said, no, put me up in the casino with everybody else. I'm good. 
You know, I'm good. We get there late at night, and I just go to my room, because I'm thinking, that's going to be a nice room, you know? And I was right. It was a nice room. And so I go to the room, I take a shower, go to bed. Well, I'm up 6 in the morning and, and down at the Pete's Coffee Place and, and working and on the phone and getting ready for the meeting coming up that, that we're doing, right? And, and uh, lights and sounds all around. It was kind of cool, but I didn't like the smell of the smoke, you know? Uh, and so one of the guys comes walking in, he gets his coffee, and so we start heading out to the valet parking, you know, because we got to be at we got to we got to be at the meeting, and and I said, hey, I'm gonna go to the bathroom real quick. So I dip in and go to the bathroom. Well, he's just kind of standing there. He likes to have fun in a casino, you know. This guy has an anointing upon his life. He's Midas. Everything he touches turns to gold. Everything he touches. And he's just standing there, and, and I come walking out. He's just slipping a 20 in this machine. He's just standing there waiting for me. Slips a 20 in, hits the button, $1,160. <laughs> right? I was like, wow! I wish I had a 20. I'd give it to you and have you put it in. Right? And so he turns around, and he cashes it out right then. The other guy, there's three of us. The other guy comes walking up. He's got a wad of cash, and he won the night before. And I'm like, man, I was like, I was honest with you guys, I said, I've never done this before, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I said, it's just not who I am, right? And, and so that, so the one guy hands me 30 bucks, he says, well, here, go stick it in something, go have fun. And then the guy who won 1160 hands me $160, I got $200 in my hand, not even mine, <laughs> right? And I'm like, okay, well, on the way out, I'm putting a 20 here, and I'm putting a 20 there, I'm losing all this money, right? Losing it all. That's uh, the grace that I have <laughs> when it comes to gambling, right? Losing, losing, losing. Well, it's just me and the one guy. The other guy kind of breaks off, and, and so I'm thinking, well, I guess I told him I'd be there in between 9 and 10. So we got about an hour leeway, so I wasn't stressing too bad. And, and uh, we kind of turn a corner after losing losing our money, and not all of it, but losing some money. And, and here's the guy that won the 1160 sitting down at a table. He just won five grand. On a poker bet. And he's telling her, he's like, man, I can't believe this. He's telling everybody, right? I started at 20 and they're like, nah, 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 they got up five grand in. I'm like, man, I'm not hanging out with you anymore. I'm losing all this. I'm hanking out with you. <laughs> right? So he's like, well, come on, let's get out of here. I said, yeah, let's get out of here. So we're on our way out. He's got a you know, handful of chips. We're on our way out. We go by another table. And he's like, oh, right, check this game out. So we walk over there and he says, banker or customer? I guess you could choose. Choose who you want to be, right? I said, I don't know. Go with Baker. So he puts it all on Baker. <laughs> I mean, started with 20 bucks, right? He puts it all on Baker. He wins! Oh my gosh. He wins! So he's like, all right, we, all right, let's go. Let's go find a cashier. He's got all these chips. He counts out eight $100 chips and hands them to me. He says, here you go. Good call. I walked out of this place with 900 bucks. <laughs> I didn't do a thing. You know what? All I did was follow these guys around. But that's our life. We've given away cars. I'm going to give that 900 away. You know, it's sitting in cash in a drawer right now. And we, we've understood that when we build altars to the Lord, He gives back. You really can't outgive God. There was a season in my life when I thought, Lord, I can outgive you because I'm giving a lot and I'm broke. I am in need. We got some wants. You know what I'm saying? But I kept going because the Word of God says that faith and patience inherits the promises of God. And I understand that if we're in a season of sowing and reaping, it takes time for all this seed to get into the ground and for fields to rise up and harvest to happen, right? And so Joy and I have just continued to, we've never missed a tithe since 1998. We've always given over and above. We've always helped out people that were in need. And I'm going to step into some things now that we're going to get into today. Whenever there's been a particular ministry that has come to the church and they've dropped a word that was revelation, We've dug down deep and we've built an altar to the Lord. Whenever a ministry has come and prophesied over us, and that was the word of the Lord, we've dug down deep and we've built an altar to the Lord with finances. And we've given. You follow me? 
Whenever God has done something significant in our life, we take an offering and we give it to the Lord. You see, back in the Old Testament days, or back in the old days, cows and sheep and turtle doves were the currency. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's what they would sacrifice on the altar. Well, now it's no longer cows and sheep and turtle doves. It's, it's Thomas's and Jefferson's and Washington's, right? Those are now the offerings that we bring to the altar. <clears throat> so I want to read some scripture here and not just talk about how it's a good idea. <laughs> but let's go to Deuteronomy 27. And we're going to start in chapter 1. This is Moses now speaking to Joseph and the people of Israel. They're just about to enter into the promised land. They're just about to cross the Jordan River here. And this is Moses, verse, chapter 27, verse 1. Then Moses and the leaders of Israel gave this charge to the people. Obey all these commands that I'm giving you today. When you cross the Jordan River and enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, set up some large stones, coat them with plaster, and write this whole body of instruction on them. When you cross the river to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey. I hope you're watching. Uh, hope you're watching, Roy. Milk and honey coming your way. <laughs> Just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. When you cross the Jordan, set up these stones at Mount, you know, Ebal, Ebal, that mountain right there. Coat them with plaster, as I'm commanding you today. Then, build an altar there to the Lord your God, using natural uncut stones. You must not shape the stones with an iron tool. But build the altar of uncut stones and use it to offer burnt offerings to the Lord your God. Also, sacrifice peace offerings on it. And celebrate by feasting there before the Lord your God. You must clearly write all these instructions on the stones coated with plaster. So something significant is happening in the lives of the Israeli people right now. Right, The Hebrew people are entering into a promise fulfilled. The Lord has promised them something. They are now entering into that promise. And the Lord says, when you enter into your promise, build an altar. Sacrifice to me. How many times have we, when we've entered into a promise that the Lord has given us, and we're entering in that, how many of us have reached down and grabbed some Jeffersons? And so, probably not. Because we don't know to. This is lost in the majority of Christ. Number one, because it's been abused. Listen, I'm not out for a big offering today. I'm not out for a big offering. I'm out to bring change to your life for the rest of your time on this earth. When the children of Israel, the Hebrew people, entered into a promise being fulfilled, they took of their currency and they sacrificed to the Lord. Cows were worth a lot of money to a family. Sheep, goats, turtle doves, they were worth a lot to a family. We don't have that type of currency anymore. We got greenbacks now. And when we enter into a promise fulfilled, we got to grab out some Jeffersons. We got to build an altar to the Lord there. You say, well, I don't know, Pastor, that's all Old Testament stuff. Well, okay, go to Philippians chapter 4. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I, was, when I first brought you the good news. And then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. 
Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. So they're building altars. They are helping Paul. They're giving, right? Go ahead. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. And that's what I'm saying here today. I'm not going into this message because I need two big offerings these next weeks because we're suffering financially. We're not suffering financially. I want to take you from suffering financially and move you into an abundance. And it's only by operating in financial truths. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. Now, we don't give to get. We give because it's truth, and that's what we're supposed to do. Getting, we just happen to be a recipient in operating in truth. Follow me? Go ahead. At the moment, I have all I need. Hey, that's where I'm at. At the moment, i got all I need and more. I can say more, too. I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me with Epaphroditus. Well, I can't say that. But I don't even know who Epaphroditus is. <laughs> <laughs> they are a sweet-smelling sacrifice. Look at that. New Testament. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Go ahead. This is the only place where you see this, the Philippian church. Why? Because Paul said, no other church did this for me but you. And then look at this verse. And this same God who takes care of me. Right? Paul said, this same God who takes care of me, who has given me all I need and more, will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which has been given to us in Christ Jesus. He said that to the Philippian church because of their giving. You can't outgive God. And I'm standing here saying to you, I have all I need and more. But I say to you, the same God who has blessed us wants to bless you. But we have to operate in the verses beforehand, right? To get this. And I'm telling you, it's not always easy. Joy and I have been choices of eating food and putting gas in our tank or tithing. We've had those choices before. We don't have those choices anymore. Now it's like, Lord, you want me to give how much to who? <sighs> Lord, is that you? You know what I'm saying? Those are, those are our conversations now, but we used to. Okay, honey. We got beans and rice from Jesus Christ. And maybe enough gas to make us through these next couple of weeks. But it doesn't matter because God is faithful and we're going to give. And we gave everything we had. Pennies left. Pennies left over. And God was faithful. $50 here. $250 there. Gas lasting longer than it should. We got more back. That, the particular time I'm talking about, we got more back given to us than what our tithe was. Come on. You can't outgive God. Yeah, Joy just said times four. It was about four times more. Because we serve a God of multiplication. But see, because this is such a difficult subject, the church hasn't taught this. I haven't taught this. I'm, I'm guilty here. I have I have for fear of not wanting to offend, for fear of, of not wanting to chase anyone away, I've steered away from certain financial truths. I got convicted and I said, all right, Lord, no more. No more. I don't care what anybody thinks. Because everybody understands that I don't receive anything from the church. I work full time. I've got a salary. 
I'm not saying this because we're hurting and I'm after a big offering, right? So I came in with a little more trust that I'm talking to a good crowd. Y'all love me and y'all y'all know I'm pastor and that I'm here for you. Let's look at a few more verses. Genesis, Genesis 8. We're going to look at a couple of verses in, in, in a couple of different chapters in Genesis. Genesis 8. That's way in the beginning. <laughs> Okay. Genesis 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Now, let's paint this picture here, right? We've got Noah, who just got through building an ark. Took him forever, right? Loaded up the ark with animals, two by two, that the Lord brought to him. Sealed it shut. It rained. All of humanity destroyed Think about that. It is you, your three sons, their three wives. And you and your wife. And your three sons and your three wives. And all these animals. And then the floods recede. And the ark lands. And the doors are released. And the animals are let out. And Noah and his family come out. And he builds an altar to the Lord. When times of trial or times of season end and you step into another season, it's a good time to build an altar to the Lord. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and there he sacrificed as burnt offerings... The animals and birds that have been approved for that purpose. And the, I'm going to go back to that. And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest. Hallelujah. Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and and night. And there's so much there. Let's go back a little bit. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. That's the beginning. <laughs> and there is sacrifices, burnt offerings, the animals and birds that have been approved for that purpose. The animals and birds that were clean. I would love to speak to a Hebrew person, a Hebrew scholar, and talk to them about that verse right there. Because my mind is a little different. I start thinking about all the animals on the ark. The word of God says that they came two by two, right? So if animals were sacrificed, what animals never made it past the flood? What animal species ended that day? You follow me? A sacrifice was made. A sacrifice was made. Think about that. It's very possible that the animal race suffered that day. Someone didn't make it. Sacrifice was made. And look at that. After that time, and then the sacrifice was made, then the Lord said, I'm not going to do that again to you. There's something about building altars to the Lord. And you, you know what? I personally believe why it's so dear to God's heart 
because we hold money so close, the cares and concerns even of finances, it takes his place in our heart so often. Jesus, your king. Oh my gosh, I can't pay my bills. Jesus, your king. Oh my gosh, I just lost my job. Right? It replaces him so often on the throne of our heart. I think that's why he moves so heavily when we sacrifice. That's a heavy one right there. Let's go to another scripture. Genesis chapter 35. I'm going to read quick because it's 15 verses, but i, I, I got to set the stage. <clears throat> then God said to Jacob, get ready and move to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob told everyone in his household, get rid of all your pagan idols, purify yourselves, put on clean clothing. We are now going to Bethel where I will build an altar to, to the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress. He has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all their pagan idols and earrings and he buried them under the great tree near Shechem. As they set out, a terror from God spread over the people in all the towns of that area, so no one attacked Jacob's family. Eventually, Jacob and his household arrived at Luz, also called Bethel and Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and named the place El Bethel, which means God of Bethel, because God had appeared to him there when he was fleeing from his brother Esau. Soon after this, Rebekah's old nurse Deborah died. She was buried beneath the oak tree in the valley below Bethel. Ever since, the tree has been called Alambakuf, which means Oak of Weeping. Verse 9. Now that Jacob had returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again at Bethel. God blessed him, saying, Your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. So God renamed him Israel. Then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You will become a great nation, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants, and I will give you the land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. Then God went up from the place where he had spoken to Jacob. And Jacob set up a stone pillar to mark the place where God had spoken to him. He built an altar. Then he poured wine over it as an offering to God and anointed the pillar with olive oil. And Jacob named the place Bethel, which means house of God, because God had spoken to him there. Whenever we come into revelation, it's a good time to build an altar. It's a good time to build an altar. There's been times where Joy and I have been places and the preacher speaking and the word of God being released. Revelation came. Light bulbs went off. Revelation came. Growth happened. We grabbed some Jeffersons and we built an altar to the Lord. And as I said earlier, when someone would speak prophetically over us, that was, that you know it was God. You know, sometimes you get prophetic words, yep, that was good. But sometimes you get prophetic words, you're like, wow, that was God. We sow into that. We sow into that. <clears throat> Building an altar. To the Lord. 
I want to go to one more scripture, and I want to be careful in ministering this scripture, and I want to rightly divide the word of God here. So I'm going to go into this scripture carefully, mindfully. First Chronicles chapter 21. And let me set the stage here for 1 Chronicles 21. The word of God said that Satan rose up against David. And caused David to say in his heart, I'm going to count all the people. I'm going to see how big this nation is. And... So David told his right-hand man, hey, this is what I want to do. And his right-hand man even said, you know, I don't know if that's quite a good idea. We need to listen to those around us. No matter how good of an idea we think it is. Boy, I'm preaching to myself right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they went ahead and counted the people. And the word of God says that they sinned. And that the Lord didn't like it. And the prophet came to David and said, David, you sinned against the Lord. And here's your three choices. I pulled the German out in me. Sorry. Here's your three choices. He said, you could either have X amount of years of famine. Choice number one. Or you could have X amount of months of being handed over to your enemies. Choice number two. Or you could have three days. There's my German again. Or you can have three days of being in the hands of the Lord. And David made a wise choice, I think, anyway. And he said, you know, instead of falling into the hands of the enemy who don't love me, let me fall into the hands of my God, that he might have mercy. And so then the word says that the Lord sent a plague. 70,000 people died in a day. That's a rough one. And David was a king who loved his people. Yeah. And David cried out to God. <clears throat> and he said, Lord, it wasn't them, it was me. Don't let them suffer. Take it out on me. And he looked up and he saw an angel. A big one. Sword drawn. And it was pointed at Jerusalem. And the Lord stayed the angel's hand. And then the angel spoke to Gad, the prophet, and said, you go tell David to build an altar to the Lord. At the wine press. That's where we're going to pick up. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with his sword drawn, reaching out over Jerusalem. So David and the leaders of Israel put, off, put on burlap to show their deep distress and fell face down on the ground. And David said to God, I'm the one who called for the census. I'm the one who has sinned and done wrong. But these people are as innocent as sheep. What have they done? Oh, Lord, my God, let your anger fall against me and my family. Do not destroy your people. That's why David was a man after God's own heart. Look at that man's character. 
Then, da then the angel of the Lord told Gad to instruct David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of the uh, Jethia site. I'm not even going to try to say his name. So David went up to do what the Lord had commanded him through Gad. Uh, the Jebusite, who was busy threshing wheat at that time, turned and saw the angel there. His four sons who were with him ran away and hid. But when the Jebusite saw David approaching, he left his threshing floor, bowed before David with his face to the ground. And David said to him, let me buy this threshing floor from you at its full price. And then I'm going to build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. And the Jebusite said, take it, my Lord the king, and use it as you wish. I'll give the oxen for the burnt offerings and the threshing boards for wood to build the fire on the altar and the wheat for the grain offering. I'll give it all to you. Hey, this guy wanted the plague to stop too, right? He said, man, I'll join with you. I'll give you everything you need to build the altar. But that wouldn't have cost David anything. What would that would have cost David? Nothing, right? Don't let anyone else build your altar to God. But King David replied to the Jebusite, No, I insist on buying it for the full price. I will not take what is yours. And give it to the Lord. I will not present burnt offerings. That have cost me nothing. So David gave the Jebusite 600 pieces of gold in payment for the threshing floor. Floor. David built an altar there to the Lord. And sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And when David prayed. The Lord answered him by sending fire from heaven to burn up the offering on the altar. Then the Lord spoke to the angel who put the sword back into its sheath. When David saw that the Lord had answered his prayer, he offered more sacrifices, didn't he? The Jebusite tried to give David everything that was needed for the sacrifice. But David said, no. It's got to cost me something. This is my altar. This is my altar. Look at the man's character. See, David made a bad decision found himself in a tough season. You see, we have been forgiven of our sins. And we have been now called the righteousness of God. We have been made holy. Sin has been dealt with. Heaven is our home. Our sin is no longer going to take us to hell. But do not be deceived. And God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. A man will reap what he sows. David made a bad decision. He was reaping of that bad decision. But then what did he do? He built an altar to the Lord. It cost him something. And God stopped the plague. And he turned David's season around. We can find ourselves in tough seasons. Our own fault. Our own fault. It's a good time to build an altar. It's a good time to build an altar. When Joy and I were saving to buy our home, we didn't hold back on tithe to pump that savings. We didn't hold back on offerings. We ended up writing a four-digit check at one point in time as we were saving for our home. We needed God to turn things around. We needed a home.
We have to learn how to build altars to the Lord. Do not allow money to take the throne of your heart. It's where Jesus belongs. And see, the hard thing is, is the world tells us, man, if you give it all away, you're not going to have nothing. But we're part of a kingdom that's backwards from this world. That in order to have everything, you've got to give it all away. And we see in Scripture the struggle that that is, right? The rich young ruler that came to Jesus. He said, Lord, what can I do? I have followed the law since my youth. Right? He says, I'm as pure as the driven snow. And Jesus looked at him. And loved him. He said, you're right. You're a good dude. Tell you what. Why don't you give everything you have to the poor and come follow me. Because God was sitting to the right side of his heart. His stuff had his whole heart. God was a close second. Close second ain't good enough. Right? He's a jealous God. He wants to be king of your heart. And I knew that this wasn't going to be a super popular word. But this will be a word that will set you up for your future. Set you up for your destiny. Set you up for your breakthrough. If we learn to build altars to the Lord, we can then say the uh, uh, Philippians verse. We can then grab the Philippians verse for ourselves. I have all I need and more. And my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. See, now you have to think about, well, what do you consider needs? See, joy and I consider needs to be able to, the ability to give to people. That's our needs. Our needs aren't selfish, right? Our needs aren't, Lord, just take care of us. Our needs are, Lord, we want to bless everyone around us. It's a need in our heart. We have to. He'll supply all your needs. Grow your needs. Yeah? Grow your needs. We need lots of homes so we can help people. Amen. We need lots of cars. Do we need three cars? No. I mean, yes. But do Joy and I need three cars? No. But our needs aren't selfish. Our needs go beyond her and I. My needs involve you guys. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. You guys are in a good spot. God's doing something. He's building. He's shaping. He's forming. He's putting a foundation together. going somewhere and I'm not going without you dang it <laughs> amen? amen let's pray father in Jesus name I thank you for your word I thank you that it's true I thank you that it's alive. And Lord, I thank you for expanding our understanding. Opening up our revelation, Lord. Showing us, God, how to operate in truths that will take us into our destiny.
Lord, I know everyone in here. And I know that they're all givers. And I know that they all want to bless people. So Lord, I thank you that as we all begin to step out in these spiritual truths concerning finances, God, the increase will come. Lord, to where the cup is overflowing and we can help the way our hearts want to help. I thank you, Lord, that you're taking us there. This nation, God, finances the gospel around the world. 98% of the missionaries and finances for the gospel come from this nation. Lord, you have raised us up to be financially strong, to finance your gospel. So I'm not going to cow. I'm not going to slink back because it might not be a popular message. Or because someone might think it's not holy or humble to be rich. Holiness and humbleness have nothing to do with how much money we have, God. We all understand it's a heart position, Lord. So I thank you, God, that you're going to bless us financially, Lord, that we can reach out and touch others with the gospel. It's all about you, Jesus. You're the one that matters. And I thank you, Lord, that you're opening up our understanding and revelation to operate in these things that you set up. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't trip over the cord. <laughs> well, guys, I just have a couple quick announcements for you. Um, this Thursday is Valentine's Day, and if you guys aren't doing anything um, with significant others or anything like that, if you have no plans, we are doing a movie here, and um, it starts at 6.30. If you guys would like to bring something. Um, so have, eating at 6.30. Okay, we're eating at 6.30. If you guys would like to bring something to eat, we do need food. Um, I have a little sign-in sheet in the back. I just need you know some quick information from you guys, but we would love to have you. Um, other than that, we do have our app. You can give on there, or you can give in the back. And we're going to be in here for the foreseeable future. We will be back again next week. And that is it.